Our next speaker, Ms. Lisa Miara, uh, did I get that right? Is the founder of the Springs of Hope Foundation, a Kurdish NGO founded in response to the Yazidi genocide, which began in 2014. Lisa lives in a Yazidi village adjacent to a 20,000 strong um, person IDP camp in which she has established a holistic education center for 200 displaced Yazidi children and teens, 100 of whom were, were rescued from cat captivity um, in the Islamic State. The center also serves as a medical center for 12, tent dwellers in the camp. Lisa has also established a restorative arts therapy center for Syrian refugees close by in War City. Today, uh, Lisa will be speaking uh, about the Yazidis, the increasing crisis in the wake of a sanitized genocide. Lisa. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Moshe Dayan Center for your hosting. Mama Kurdistan, Mabruk, I'm sure I'm going to be your Kurdistan postman, and I'll do it very happily. To the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I am so honored, so proud to be able to live and to work in the Kurdistan region of Iraq as an Israeli and as a Jew, and to have you guys, Mr. Chaim Perry, Margalit Gever, or Itvir, so solidly behind us pouring not just words and not just encouragement and not just strengthening and not just friendship and not just relationship, but practical, practical finance to help this Yazidi broken minority get back on its feet and become an integrated part of Kurdistan, which is what we're, we're wanting to see. Zach, I've seen you somewhere around here. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm wondering already. <laughs> Hazard. Zach, I've seen you around here. Thank you for your ongoing, unfailing support. You're always in our court and always doing the best to network and collect us. So it is such a joy to be here. I have a wonderfully strong academic background, all of which is zero use to me in this field because the very short version was that in 1998 I started Springs of Hope Foundation here as an Israeli non-profit amuta going into the field of dealing with the Hamas terror that had hit Jerusalem in particular. And over these years of working with the victims of terror in Jerusalem, my, my area of research actually became the international funding through the legal bank systems of the world of terror organizations. And that took me with along of uh, a group of uh, American researchers and lawyers into Halabja, Kurdistan in uh, February 2015. And we spent about four days down in Halabja meeting the victims of Saddam Hussein's Anfal campaign or part of his Anfal campaign. And from there, because the, the, the Nosei, the subject of the Yazidi genocide, A, it was hot, Sadly, it was a very sexy um, sort of V on our checklist. We'll go and see the Yazidis and we'll tick it off as an NGO or as any kind of humanitarian aid group and then move on. But something had got me with this Yazidi genocide. And it was nothing about a, a CV or an agenda and I had no plans certainly to live in a, a tiny Yazidi village with, with sheep and chickens and, and flowing sewage, but it was part of that Jewish conscience, having gone through the Holocaust, you know, as a family, that one could not turn a blind eye, one could simply not walk away, be so close, and yet, and yet not examine it. And we had literally about six hours, and we drove from Halabja up to Sharia, and life changed for me. I did not expect to be um, establishing a Kurdish NGO. We're now actually in the process of establishing an Iraqi NGO, not because I have any desire uh, to go and work in Iraq or in Sinjar, but simply because of the, the levels of, of uh, the Iraq control over, particularly over the banking systems, the documentation requires it. So I chose for my subject 
which is the, this, this, the, the, the topic of this panel is the minorities in limbo, and that is how I see the Yazidi population. Now, we're to, to really cover this subject, one's been discussing it for four and a half years and it hasn't been covered, so certainly in 20 minutes it will not, but it will at least give food for thought and throw out some bullet points that maybe another time can be, can be more unpacked. The Yazidi... Um, catastrophe is incredibly complex. Even by saying a sanitized genocide, what do I mean? And I would like to show you some pictures of our kids, of kids that we do life with, that come into our center day by day. Each one of these children has been rescued or escaped from Daesh, from ISIS, either in Mosul or in Raqqa, Syria, and some of them you'll see and notice the recent exodus of Yazidi kids from uh, Bakhuz in Syria. I am hopelessly not technical, but I'm going to try this. So this is the beginning of the genocide that, in my opinion, it was whitewashed, it was made pal palatable to world governments, it was made palatable to the press, and the main components of this genocide were absolutely overlooked and swept aside. This was when Daesh swept into the Sinjar in August 2013, and 400,000 people were displaced, shot into mass graves, had concrete poured open them, or were taken off into Tel Afar, Mosul, and Raqqa, Syria. And I have deliberately here listed the points of genocide according to the resolution of the 17th of August, 1949, is, is, a, a the, is killing a members of a group, is causing seriously bodily or mental harm to any member of that group is de deliberately afflicting upon the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction in whole or part. This is Thomas. Today he is 12 years old. He was, he was probably about 10 here, I would say. And he was discovered in the rubble of Mosul. He'd been a tank driver. He'd been forced to wear um, Hagorat Nefits. I got a suicide, belt. suicide belt every day of his life in care he dared to explode. And he was discovered starved underneath the rubble of Mosul. Ask him what he ate for his three years of serving the army of ISIS. Maybe two pieces of rotten fruit a day. That was it. This is Imad found... A friend of his found in under a different captor's house the same story. This is Feroz. The treaty that was signed on the 17th of August 1949. Also it said genocide is impo imposition of measures intended to, protect, to prevent births within this group. This girl has had all of her internal organs taken out. And so she will never, ever conceive. Many of the girls that are coming out in the past three weeks from Bahus are in the same physical situation. And this has happened to them because they are a minority group with no rights and no one to be a voice and no one to stand up and protect them. Thomas, and here we have Sufyan. Just two weeks ago, he was released from Bahuz. Sufyan could not stand up on his feet because he has been tortured for five years now, four and a half years, with electric cables on the soles of his feet on a daily basis. He has been starved. All the calcium has gone out of his bones, so he cannot even stand. This girl here, Wadita, she came out one week ago. Likewise, raped. Her child is the product of a captor of ISIS. These are the kids as they were discovered or, or rescued by the Syrian Democratic Forces just three weeks ago. All of these kids now are inside our center on a daily basis. This is Sinjar City. So if one was to say, well, why don't the Yazidis go back to Sinjar City? Where are they going to go? If we take, if we take the, the village of Talbanat, 
It is still full of landmines. No one has set foot to remove one landmine in nearly five years. If we take the villages of Tel Kassab, of um, Tel Azir, they are annexed to Baj. The Yazidis have property in Sinjar. They've lived there for hundreds if not thousands of years. But the Iraqi government holds the title deeds. No one holds a title deed to a piece of property in Sinjar. I could go to Sinjar today and buy 200 square meters of land for $150. But, but, we were privileged, we were wrecked to be invited to the opening of the mass graves just, I think, two weeks ago, last Friday in Kocho. Kocho is one of the villages that typifies this Yazidi genocide, where the day before this entire village was dancing at a wedding, and the next day half the men were shot in mass graves, the women were taken off either to Tel Afar or to Mosul. Uh, most of the, the residents of Kocho live in Kadia camp, which is close to the Turkish border. It is a camp that five years later, it smells of death. You do not hear the sound of laughter in Kadia camp. You do not hear songs. When people get married, they get married in total silence because their life is still with these people in their mass graves, in the families. This was the uh, Yazidi delegation along with representatives of the UN, representatives from the Erbil government and the government of Baghdad beginning the, the long exhumation process. There are an estimated 73 mass graves in Sinjar. That's only an estimation. Pictures of the dead, the lost, the missing inside Kojo. These two kids are now with us, Avian and, I uh, forget his name, Hay Hayden, I think, came out just two days ago, three days ago. Sharia camp today, five years later, as in all of the 22 internally displaced camps in the province of Duhok, it is a disgrace. The camps were erected in a hurry, Yes, to give home to 400,000 Yazidis on the run from ISIS. And that was a fair job done by the UN and by, by Afad from Turkey. But five years later, friends, you have a people that I do not believe the Yazidis are suffering from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I do not believe they're suffering from chronic PTSD. I believe that the Yazidis and our kids just down the road in War City who have escaped from Khalab, escaped from Homs, escaped from Raqqa and escaped from Deir Ezzor, and two of three have more recently come out from Afrin where their families were gone but bombed by chemical gas. I believe we're looking at human devastation syndrome. And this is why I call it a sanitized genocide. And when there are genocides coming, and when there are demographic shifts coming that are going to affect this minority population, if we do not face up now to what has happened and what is still going on, we have no ability to protect these people who are suffering from human devastation syndrome. When I talk about a community in limbo, it is a community that is so broken that the women stand like this all day. They're not on Facebook friends, they're not Twittering the latest tweet from Sharia camp or Kabato camp. They're looking at the picture of their five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten kids who are still lost and still dead. They have epileptic attacks, attacks two, three, four times a day. They have fainting fits and are on the ground. This is human devastation system syndrome. If I take any of our kids in our classes, and we now have classes, 20, 20 I know, be, 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 mamash meduyak, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And the balance has changed even since I gave you that introduction of we are now around 250 kids a day in school of which 150 are kids that have come out of Daesh. Plus all of these, these rescuees now from Bahuz. Now, I've got kids who came out of Daesh six months ago, like Tomas. I'll show you some more. Tomas or Alo or Bazan. She came out just uh, last week. Look, this is an indication of little Ali's wrist. 
He had been fed one plate of rice for four and a half years. And I said to him, Ali, like, how much is one plate? And he would do this, this amount of rice for four and a half years, and he cannot stand up. So we today have around about, oh, I have to show you, look, Hadia. When she came out two weeks ago, the kids who were rescued in the last six to nine month period looked at children like Hadia as if they were animals. Because this last in six, six to nine months has caused more rotting of the soul and the spirit, rotting of the body, and the levels of brainwashing are off the radar, friends, are off the radar. So how do we dare put this in a tiny package and tidy and let Western media come in and take photographs of women and say, oh, she was raped 20 times, she was married 14 times. And with that, we're finished with a question of genocide? Genocide is ongoing. If we take alone the principle that was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in March 2005, I believe, the responsibility to protect, which declares a sovereign state is responsible for the protection of its minority groups. Where has that been implemented? The principle states that it is to be implemented by diplomatic means, by humanitarian means, and if those do not exceed, then the right of force according to the, the, the uh, United Nations Security Council. This right, oh, Ken, tada, this um, responsibility to protect states that rape is a war crime. This principle of responsibility to protect states that mass rape is ethnic cleansing. And we have dared to sanitize and to repackage this as it's just happening over there to a few women in the Middle East who are of no consequence to us, so let them get on with it. We have not begun to discuss issues of politics, issues of, of national and ethnic identity. If I walk into a class of 20 kids, six years old, and I give them a piece of paper and I say, draw a flag. One would draw a white flag because he came out of Daesh last week. One who is angry because he has no idea who he is, he's been so brainwashed, would draw a, dash, a, a, flag, a black flag of Daesh. One who is so happy to be out and living in a tent, although all his family have gone and he has nothing, would draw the flag of Kurdistan and proudly wave it. One would draw a flag of Iraq. One would draw a flag of, of of Kurdistan, but with an Iraqi soldier shooting at it? These kids have lost their identity. They don't know if they're Iraqi. They don't know if they're, if they're Kurdish. They don't know if they're Yazidi. The kids that are coming out from Bahuz have called us infidels, have called the kids that were released six months ago infidels, have said, please, Muhammad is wonderful. Let us pray down to Muhammad. So this is our current situation without discussing issues of land, to whom or who is going to take responsibility for Sinjar, Iraq or Erbil? What is their identity? What is their passport? What is their genocide, their, their ID card? It is incredibly complicated. These are, again, two pictures of kids that came out just last two weeks ago. Six months ago from Mosul. This is part of the restorative therapy that we give them or aim to give them. These three were leading fighters in Daesh. They were all in an elite intelligence unit. They have all also, these two have murdered in cold blood many, including Yazidis, buried Yazidis, because of the levels of brainwashing. This one could have been released a year prior to his uh, forced rescue by his family, who finally said, you have to come home. Why did he choose to stay with Daesh? Because he believed in the social justice and the social welfare of, of Daesh, and he was trained to set up the caliphate in Kurdistan. We've taken on massive risks by taking these kids, but if we don't help them, who will? This, to me, is an awesome picture. 
because it was at Nuroz just on the 21st with two kids that came out of Bahuz that took the Kurdistan flag and from my car waved the flag of Kurdistan. So, shukran, zospas. Thank you.